Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone to worship this morning. Um, those that are engaging in worship this morning are only those that are here. Um, we ran into a battery issue, and all everyone else at home is seeing are those green, yellow, orange bars. So uh, we're trying to get that charged and fix it. Hopefully they can join in a bit. Um, but related to that, um, there's all these little nuances with live streaming that uh, are, we're constantly learning about. Um, we sent out a thing about subscribing to our YouTube channel. And if some of you might um, have done that already, if you haven't, if you could go on and there's a just a little, I think it's a bell that you click. You don't have to put any information in. It's not like subscribing for Time Life magazine or something where you'll get it for the rest of your life and get charges every now and then. There, it's just um, a, a way to say that you want to follow the channel. If we get 15 more people, uh, I think we're at 85 right now, if we get to 100 subscribers, we get a dedicated link that right now for the live stream, we have to set up the live stream and then there's a unique link for that that needs to go out. So it, we need to wait till Sunday morning. That's why if you were at home watching last week, um, the link that I sent out was no longer good and then a new one needed to be sent out. It just makes things smoother that it's always the same link that you go to. So uh, if you're bored this afternoon, think, hey, I'm going to subscribe, you know, and go on. And then you can tell people you are a YouTube subscriber. It will help us out. If you've got family members, just have them do it or take their phone and do it for them. I guess I, I can say that. We're not on the internet right now, so you have no proof I said it. But uh, so that would, that would help us out a lot. Um, as we begin in worship today, are there any things that we can share as announcements, uh, prayer concerns, things to lift up? No? All right. Well, let's join together as we rise and we enter God's presence in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, as we come in this place, we are grateful that we can gather in worship of you. And Lord, we do pray for those that are seeking you out at home that your spirit in a special way, as you are able to do again and again, would encounter their hearts, would maybe even use it as um, some of a blessing where they might turn and have a private time of devotion with you that might be desperately needed. You're able to bring all things to form and to conform into your good for your people. And for us here this morning in this room, we ask your Holy Spirit to come and join us. Help us to remember that of all the stresses and all the things that we deal with in life, they are but a blink of an eye compared to our walk with you. Lord, what you have called us to, a life lived for you, a life of eternity with you is unmatched. And there are so many things that can take our focus away, so many things that can say, well, I, I wish it would be this way or that. And Lord, there's times we follow down those roads and we sacrifice your calling. But here in this moment today, we have a choice to pour our hearts out to you, to allow you to speak to us, to give us direction and guidance, and to help us remember that on our journey in life, it is not just about the things that we see and do and the plans that we have, but we encounter life and we stand facing life in the name of Jesus the Christ. Just as young David stood on the battlefield, walking out to Goliath, he says, I come against you not with sword and spear, not with the might of an army and my own tact and my own skill in battle, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty. Lord, with you at our side, there is nothing that you cannot do through us. And we pray that you would continue to strengthen us and hear our cries of worship this morning as we sing out to you, the God that has broken every chain. Would you break those chains that still bind us today by the power of your Holy Spirit? In your name we pray. Amen.
Did anybody else feel like they were singing awfully high? Yeah. Maybe there's a reason the live I stream did. cut. Um, <laughs> yeah, I got tape ready for this. I will fear no evil.
be seated. You know, when the Bible talks about evil, wickedness, um, unrighteousness, uh, in my mind, I, I think of like the wicked witch of the West. I think she was from the West, right? Was there one from the East? Yes. Oh, okay. Well, we might, we don't need to talk about the dead. So. <laughs> yeah, so, um, the, the wicked witch, witch of the, the West. Like you think of just evil, you know, purposefully manipulative, manipulative and uh, all sorts of things. And um, the Bible definitely, when it talks about evil, talks about things like that. That there are things in our world that are manipulative, that are uh, sinister, that have no good intention at all. But um, the, the words in, in scripture of evil, unrighteousness, wickedness, are also used to describe things that are outside of God's will. So they're things that are um, even benign or can even be good in a sense, but it's not what God is saying to do. So there's oftentimes in the Old Testament where God's people do something that apparently looks good, but God told them not to do it because it wasn't time, because it wasn't uh, where he was leading. And so the, the word kind of evil, wicked, unrighteous, uh, sometimes we think, well, you know, I can't think of things that are evil that are coming against me. And we sing that words, you know, I'll fear no evil. But it's also saying I'll fear um, or I will not fear those things that are apart from God's will. You know, those doubts, those things that slip in, those things that kind of take us away from where God's leading us. All those different things that cause us sometimes to worry and fear. Um, God is calling us not to fear them. He's saying that he has power over them. It isn't just the, the creepy, evil things. Um, is the live stream up and running now? Okay, that's a weird place to jump in. So, hello people at home. Um, the, uh, it, it's not just those different things, but it is the, anything that is apart from God's will that scares us. Um, and even the, the desire to follow after God's will when it's scary, thinking about the alternative. Um, and as we were singing that, that just kept going through my mind that it's not just the, the wicked things that we think of that we should stand without fear, but it's anything that sets itself up against the knowledge and the call of Jesus in our life. Um, so, but for those of you that are joining online, we do welcome you. Sorry we had a battery issue, um, and we're glad that you're with us, and hopefully uh, you'll be with us again, um, or that you won't cut out again, uh, but we will get that sorted out for next week. So I uh, apologize for that. But let us continue to worship.
Father, we are grateful that even though we are in need of forgiveness, it is amply available through your spirit. And Lord, as we cry out for revival, we recognize that it begins with us. It begins with a recognition of our own sin. It begins with a, a repentance, a turning, a coming towards you. And an amazing transformation that you continually work and exert within our life as we live as your people, being forgiven for the mistakes that we make along the way and being shaped and molded not by our own intellect and our own craft, but by your spirit that is able to take hearts of despair and turns them into hearts of joy, regardless of what's going on around us, regardless of the many things that draw and pull at us. You're a God that is beyond them all. And Lord, there will be a day where you will return and every knee in this entire earth will bow before you. Every knee, whether they've acknowledged you or not, will bow in submission to the creator of all that we are and all that we know. And Lord, I pray that we would be among those that you recognize, that you see. And God, I pray that you would help us as your church continually reach out to more and more people that as your word says, that you're not slow in bringing your salvation. You're not slow in returning, as some think of slowness, but you are desperately wanting all to come to repentance. And Lord, it begins with me. Well, it begins with us coming and falling on our face before you in acknowledgement of our sin, and then holding up the joy of the forgiveness that we have, that we can have a pure heart, not because our intentions are pure or we get everything right, but because you have placed your spirit living and alive within us, transforming, encouraging, and strengthening. You're doing that right now, Lord, in our hearts. As we gather here and as we gather at home, your Holy Spirit is mending, repairing, restoring, healing your people to be able to go forward with your good and your message. So, Lord, we accept it all that you have to offer for us today. Would you shower down upon us? Amen. You know, we're reading through the um, Gospel of John on our online Thursday evening Bible study. If you want to join us, you're welcome to. Uh, and the link is the same every week for that. Oddly enough, I don't know why that link is the same and the link for worship is not, but um, that's another story. And one of the things that uh, we haven't gotten to yet, but we will get to, is that the center of John's gospel is um, the passage where Jesus says that um, he is the vine and we are the branches. That uh, parable that he tells, that apart from him we can do nothing, but through him we can do all things. That's the center of John's message of the gospel, is that we are grafted in to that vine with our heavenly father being the gardener and that connection is so paramount, paramount in John's mind that he puts it at the center of his story of who Jesus was and who we are called to be in response to that. So as we sing this, um, You're the Vine, um, let that just reside in your hearts that uh, of all the things that we can do, the, the tasks we can accomplish, the ministries we can engage in, the most important thing is that we abide in him and he will abide in us.
you're able, would you rise as we sing this? And allow your spirit to feel, you know, we have a little fancy graphic up there rising, but may your spirit rise to connect to that vine. Did I miss a scripture? Um, okay. Let's go back to that other scripture. Um, we'll just read both, and then we'll sing this song again. And I, I guess I was just feeling God calling us to go back and read it, because God's message in the Old Testament is um, the same in the New. And we often think of 
them as distinctly different, and they are in some ways, but um, when you read through the New Testament, Jesus isn't really calling the people to something that is, is uh, a divergent or different from what God was saying in the Old Testament. It is actually a fulfillment. Um, it is making uh, fuller. It is um, accomplishing the things in the Old Testament, and you really see this beautiful picture of God in the Old Testament and Jesus being one and the same, which is what Jesus says. Uh, but you also see a great love of God and a call from God that is a, a very um, strong call, but it is as an honest call saying, these are the stakes. This is what is going on. This is what is set before you. I need you to hear it clearly. And he's calling and pleading with his people to come and to choose to follow after him. And so in Jeremiah, um, through the prophet Jeremiah, God says this, I am with you and I will save you, declares the Lord. Wait, I didn't read the rest of that. Um, though I, I completely destroy all the nations among which I scatter you, I will not completely destroy you. I will discipline you, but only in due measure. I will not let you entire, go entirely unpunished. This is what the Lord says. Your wound is incurable. Your injury beyond healing. There is no one to plead your cause. No remedy for your sore no healing for you. You know, this is a, a message, this is a side note um, that is forgotten in our day, that we often think that whatever we're facing, um, I'm not talking just about physical illness, but he, God is talking about the state that we exist in eternity with him. He is saying there is nothing on this earth, there is nothing that you can do that can find you to regain that union with God, to regain that eternal peace that we were created to have. And yet we have all these warring ideas in our world saying you can achieve it through this, you can achieve it through that. And he is making very clear for the good of us as his people that the wounds of our sin cannot be healed on our own. It can't be through just uh, determination saying, I'm just going to really try hard. Um, have you ever tried that? It seems like the harder you try, like the worse it gets. And it's harder and harder and harder. And God is saying to us that it is incurable. The good news is, is that it isn't incurable for God. And he says, all your allies have forgotten you. They care nothing for you. I have struck you as an enemy would and punished you as would the cruel because your guilt is so great and your sins so many. Why do you cry out over your wound, your pain that has no cure? Because of your great guilt and many sins, I have done these things to you. But all who devour you will be devoured. All your enemies will go into exile. Those who plunder you will be plundered. All who make spoil for you, I will despoil. Did you know despoil was a word? Did you? Pretty neat. No. Anyway. But I will restore you to health and heal your wounds, declares the Lord. Because you are called an outcast, Zion from whom no one cares. This is what the Lord says. I will restore the portions of Jacob's tent and have compassion on his dwelling. The city will be rebuilt on her ruins. The palace will stand in its proper place. From them will come the songs of thanksgiving and the songs of rejoicing. I will add to their number and they will not be decreased. I will bring them honor and they will not be disdained. Their children will be as in the days of old and their community will be established before me. I will punish all who oppress them. I think we had the wrong scripture in there. It goes on in Jeremiah. Sorry. I kept thinking it was getting to it. Uh, it, it goes on in Jeremiah. Um, yeah, it's not there. Where God says to the people, he says, I, I set before you now, in light of all this that he has said, in light of the incurable wounds that you have, not just in the plights that you face in this life, but the incurable wounds of finding life as it was meant to be. And in the case of your sin, that we not only have those wounds, but we have them and we have sinned against God in such a way that deserves punishment. God says, but now I will bring healing. But I set before you life and I set before you death. He says, follow after me where you will find life. Or he says, turn away where you will find death. He makes a very clear distinction between the two, and he is offering it not to make people feel um, horrible about the wounds, but it is about lifting up 
the offer of salvation, the offer of life that he's giving his people. And in that context, if you'd like to rise um, for the gospel lesson in Matthew chapter 7, where Jesus says this, he says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but bad trees bear bad fruit. And good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my heavenly Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. This is the word of God for his people. You may be seated. Heavenly Father, it is hard to hear those words and not have a sense of self-condemnation and a sense of fear of, am I that one? It cries out, Lord, Lord. And the heart-wrenching thought of you turning. But Lord, you don't say these words to bring despair. If they do bring despair, in, it is only to convict us to be able to come and turn towards you. But Lord, I pray that as we gather here this morning, you would open our hearts, that you would open our spirits to hear what you are actually saying. It's in our modern English language, it, it, it may sound kind of a, a, a strange statement. It's someone prophesying and, and casting out demons and performing miracles, and you say, oh, I didn't even know you. But Lord, you're saying something very specific, just as God, you have always done, to help us know the way to life. And I pray that you would reveal it to us today, that you would reveal what you've laid on my heart this week, that it can be used by your spirit to encourage, to lift up, to point our feet as we sang in the way that we should go, and not to cause despair, and not to breed fear, but to bring a hope and a joy of knowing a God that has set a path for us that leads to life. Lord, we ask this in your name. Amen. Have you ever seen someone using their cell phone um, so intently that they get into trouble with it? Like they're walking and they walk off a pier? Have any of you done that? No? Or they walk into a wall or into a, a pole or something like that? Um, you guys haven't? You have? Okay. Do you want to tell us about it? Okay. Um, I'll tell you one of mine. I was uh, in an elevator at the hospitals. Um, I normally get on my phone and I check my messages because if I'm doing that, people won't talk to me. Uh, and it's, so even if I have no messages, I'm just like, yes, I, I have a lot going on. Uh, I must get back to these people, you know, and so that way they don't talk. But people come in and, and sometimes I really am checking them and they all come in and then um, they all leave and I, I leave with them and I uh, get out of my introvert bubble and I realize I'm on the wrong floor. You know, it gives kind of a new definition to going along with the crowd. Um, have you ever been at a stoplight and the cars in the lane next to you start to go but you don't have a green light and your foot kind of comes off the brakes for a second and then you realize, well wait, it, they're going, I'm not going. Um, we're kind of used to that. When, when other people move, when, when the crowd, when the current goes, we tend to naturally sort of want to go with it. If everybody in this room got up and all of a sudden ran out the building, even though you might not know why, you probably would too, right? I would because I'd wonder, what do they know that I don't know? I'm going with them. You know, this idea of going along with the crowd is something that when we hear Jesus' words uh, that he speaks in our gospel lesson, 
we can think that Jesus is saying, don't go along with the crowd. You know, that broad is the, is the road and wide is the gate that leads to destruction. And many are on it, but narrow is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. And we can think it's just a, a simple commentary where he's saying, don't just go along with the crowd. Don't follow peer pressure. Don't just go where, where everyone's going, but think uh, carefully about your steps. And, and Jesus would agree with that. But what he is saying is so much deeper than that. What are you saying has much deeper implications in our lives? And there are two things that come into play with Jesus' statement that then his following statements of um, giving a description about trees that bear different fruits and about this example of people that may come that represent those, uh, what he would call bad trees, and then a verdict that he offers. The verdict that he offers at the end is the same that God was offering in Jeremiah that we didn't read the exact words of where there are only two outcomes in life. And this is sometimes hard to hear, but there is either, in the end, a life with God or a life apart from God. Our world today is filled with so many competing ideas that are calling us to come and follow. Whose side are you on? Have you seen that in different places? Calling us to, to pledge allegiance to different ideas or different things or different movements or different philosophies Okay, kind of saying, come and you must agree with this or agree with this. And this is the way, and this is the way, and this is the way. God has always said, in the end, there are only two. It is with God, through Jesus Christ, or apart from God. And it's a hard truth to hear. It causes us to get kind of squirmy and uncomfortable because it makes us look at ourselves and say, well, Man, I want to be with God, but, you know, I, I, I get afraid because I know my own life and I know that, that I'm not perfect and, and I have wounds that are incurable. But the good news is that Jesus' death and resurrection gives us complete forgiveness for those. But Jesus talks about these two things, a gate and a road. What's the difference between a gate and a road? Do you know, Ben? Ben? Okay. Well, you said a, a gate you go through and a road you walk. A gate is a transition point. A road is a journey. That's what Jesus is saying um, in, in part, that he's saying that there is um, wide and broad entry points in our world to all sorts of journeys. And they can change and move all over the place. And what he is saying is that they are crowded. He's not, sometimes we think of this as the broad road is the easy way and the narrow road is the hard way. And there might be some to that because you, you need to be deliberate and you need to be looking and, and finding. But he's not saying that one is easier than the other. He's saying that one is crowded, one has many options, one is completely broad with all these entry points that can change back and forth. But he's saying that even though they are many, they all lead to the exact same place, which is a life without God. And he is saying there is only one gate, a narrow gate, the life of Jesus Christ himself. And that is an entry point. It is the transition point of deciding to say, I will follow after you, making the claim, Lord, Lord. Do you know what the word Lord means? Do you? It means master. It means owner of me. It means the one that I am beholden to, the one that I am submitting to, the one that I am giving complete charge over my life. That's the entry point. When we talk about coming to faith in Christ and accepting Jesus into our life, that's what we're asking. We're not saying from this point on, I am going to be perfect. You know, that I'm, I'm never going to do anything wrong, that I'm going to get everything right, and I'm going to be the most kindest, most gentlest, most perfect, perfect person you've ever met. I don't think I could say that fast multiple times, but it's saying, I want to take my life and I want to turn it over to you. I want you to be the one that sits on the throne of my life. So to say, Lord, Lord, is not just an idle thing to say that I know that you are a Lord. It's not saying that I know that you are the creator of all things or I know that you are um, in this position, but it is saying that you are that for me. We might be able to name, if you are great at history, the presidents and the kings and the rulers of all the countries on this earth right now. But it doesn't mean you're following them. It doesn't mean that you're submitting under their rule. 
When we say, Lord, Lord, it isn't indicating that, that these individuals, as he goes on, that they are saying to Jesus, Lord, Lord, in the sense that they are trying to say, we are under you. We have submitted to you. We have put our life as a devotion before you. And as we'll hear, Jesus ends up saying, no, you didn't. No, you were doing something different, but you weren't living a life of devotion. And so he's saying that there is a gate, which is that, that intent in our life to say, I want to be devoted. And then there is a journey, there is a road that lives it out. We don't do it perfectly. I don't think anyone ever can. I know I certainly can. But it is an intent that that gate through which we've entered, that gate of saying, God, I give my life to you, it is that every day we desire to walk on that road, to say today, I want to follow your purpose and your plan. Not my own, not my own interests or what I think it should be or where I think it should go, but yours in my life. That's hard to do. But yet it is a call that God calls us to. And he gives this example um, of false prophets. And he says, watch out. Watch out for the false prophets. Do you know why he says false prophets and not just uh, evildoers? You know, sometimes the evildoers you can see. You know, those that are blatantly against God, you can see. Those that are saying that, um, you know, God doesn't exist at all, you notice and you say, well, yeah, I'm not going to follow after that. But he says, there are people that will commandeer who God is for their purposes and try to get you to follow after that instead. And the, the language that he uses with the trees are saying that the end result of the tree is the fruit. So any of you that have planted gardens, have any of you done that already? Okay. I always want to. Uh, Isaac, Ben, and I did it a couple years ago. That was pretty cool, wasn't it? And we keep forgetting. Then it gets to be winter, and we miss the chance. Um, but I, I remember planting stuff and them asking, what will this be? This little leaf thing. What will it be? Not meaning what size will it be and what color will it be, but what will the end result, what will the fruit end up being? Because it is exactly... Uh, representative and connected to the plant itself. Jesus is using the same idea with the trees, that the end result of the tree is the fruit. And so different teachings that come along, Jesus is saying, be careful because those teachings, look at the end result of it. Look where it is leading. Follow that teaching out. Compare it to other things in scripture and see, is it leading to the same place that Jesus' message of the gospel leads? Or does it just seem good in the beginning? We hear about this in um, the life of the church even right now. In the guides of love, we allow all sorts of things and say that it is permissible because it is love. But when you follow it through to its end result, you see that it isn't love at all, but it is an agenda. And Jesus is saying here that exact thing, to be careful, because our goal is to choose life. To have that entry point of saying, Lord, I submit to you and then walk that every day in submission to who you are. Jesus goes on and gives this example of these folks that come that they say, you know, Lord, 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 when he comes back and apparently they are on the broad road and they come and they say, Lord, Lord, master, in a sense of, I want to give you the exact translation of that if I can see if I still had it in my notes. Um, divine master is the, the exact wording of that Lord. Divine master, divine master, meaning heavenly beyond me, God that is master of my life. That's what they're saying. Divine master, you are our master. We have been submissive to you. We have done your will. And then they give examples. They say, we have prophesied, it gets translated in your name. We have cast out demons in your name and we have performed many miracles uh, in your name. It's interesting, the Greek words there don't have a preposition on it, uh, which means that the, the meaning of that word isn't in, but it's with. That we have prophesied with your name. We have commandeered, you know, your, your cause and your purpose to do these different things. And apparently what they were prophesying, what they were telling, prophecy is simply trying to take the truth of God and make it known on earth. It's not necessarily predicting the future, even though in the Bible we do have that happening. It's taking the truth of God and making it known. So he's saying that they will come and they will say, we have submitted to you. We have taught your truths with your name. We have cast out demons, so they think, with your name. 
We perform miracles. In 2 Timothy, I think it is, we hear that there are, um, there are those that masquerade as children of the light and even perform miraculous signs. God is then, Jesus is then saying to them, not in a rebuke of it wasn't enough, not in a rebuke of saying, well, yeah, you, you prophesied, you cast out demons and you did miracles, but it wasn't enough miracles. It wasn't enough demons. It wasn't enough prophesying. His message to them is that none of that was for me. None of that was ever in consideration of what my plan was or in submission to me. Your claim of Lord, Lord is invalid, not because God wants to make it invalid. It's because they never submitted to who God was. They commandeered God for a purpose and an agenda. And I feel strongly we're living in a time and we are moving into a time where the church is going to be required to stand up under God's purpose and agenda, under God's will and intent for who we are. And it doesn't mean that we're perfect. It doesn't mean that we know all the answers, but it means that we enter through that narrow gate saying, God, I recognize my position in life is to be submissive to you in everything that I do. And I will work at that as best I can. These individuals Jesus talks about aren't people that just got it wrong here or there, but it is described as a pattern that every step of their way, they were looking to their own intentions. That's why Jesus states clearly, I never knew you. It isn't because he didn't want to know them, it's because they never came to know him. And as we walk that road, recognizing that our belief in who Jesus is, isn't just a statement. It's easy to pledge allegiance, it's harder to live and prove that allegiance. And Jesus is telling us very plainly, not to make us kind of fearful, but to help us see with clear eyes. He says, come through that narrow gate, through understanding that it is through allegiance to me as your master, and living that daily, that you will find life as it was meant to be. Life to the fullest in this life now, even though you, there's persecutions, difficulties, and sufferings, and perfection in all eternity. Let me close. Um, last week I shared um, a book from Rabbi, Zachari Rabbi Zacharias called Seeing Jesus from the East. And um, he wrote another book, and I figured I'll share a story that relates to this that he writes um, in that book. And it goes as this, and I'm just going to read it as he wrote it. He says, there's a magnificent story in Marie Chaplin's book of uh, Whom the World Was Not Worthy. The book told of the suffering of the true church in Yugoslavia, where so much wrong had been perpetrated by the political politicalized eschatological hierarchy. Maybe I should have paraphrased. That which has gone on in the name of Christ for the enriching and empowering of corrupt church officials has been a terrible affront to decency. One day, an evangelist by the name of Jakov arrived in a certain village and he, um, he commit, com I really need to read, learn how to read. He commiserated with an elderly man named Kremenimia on, it almost sounds like this is a joke. It really isn't a joke. It'll get to the point. Uh, on the tragedies it had experienced and talked to him about the love of Christ, um, Kremenimia abruptly interrupted Jokhev and told him that he wished to have nothing to do with Christianity. He reminded Jokhev of the dreadful history of the church in his town a history filled with plundering, exploiting, and indeed even with killing of innocent people. My own nephew was killed by them, he said, and angrily refused any effort by Jokhev's part to talk about Christ. They wore those elaborate coats and hat and caps and crosses, he said, signifying a heavenly commission, but their evil design in their lives I cannot ignore. Jokhev, looking for an occasion to get uh, Kremeria to change his line of thinking, said, Kremeria, can I ask you a question? Suppose if I were to steal your coat, put it on, break into a bank. Suppose further that the police sighted me running in the distance, but could not catch up with me. 
One clue, however, put them onto your tra track. They recognized your coat. What would you say to them if they came to your house and accused you of breaking into the bank? I would deny it, said Crimea. Ah, but you, we saw your coat, they would say, retorted Jakov. This analogy quite annoy, annoyed Crimea, who ordered Jokhav to leave his home. Jokhav continued to return to the village periodically just to befriend um, his new friend, encourage him, and share the love of Christ with him. Finally, one day, Crimea asked, how does one become a Christian? And Jokhav taught him the simple steps of repentance from, uh, from sin and to trust in the work of Jesus and, ge and gently pointed him to the shepherd of his soul. Kermiria bent his knee on the soil with his head bowed and surrendered his life to Christ. He rose to his feet, wiping tears from his eyes, embraced Jokhav and said, thank you for being in my life. And then he pointed to heaven and whispered, you wear his coat very well. Would you pray with me? Lord, we are called to not just claim you as Lord, but to wear your coat well. We are called to be disciples, followers, Christians. That word originally was used as a derogatory word for your church, literally meaning little Christ. The early church wore your coat so well that the unbelieving world said, you're just like him. You're just like that man that died on the cross. And your church saw that and heard that and said, that's exactly right. We say, Lord, Lord, Master, and we live it out in our everyday life. Lord, our world is filled with so many competing ideas. And even the idea that there is one way, a narrow gate, and all the rest are lumped into one is even offensive to many. But Lord, you call us to that truth. And you call us to share that truth with others that others may know and come into that submissive life with you, walking that devoted life on our knees before you. Lord, I pray that we as your church would be able to live that, that we would be reminded of your grace knowing that we will not always stay perfectly on that path, but as our hearts are deliberate in continually submitting to you, we will journey on it. And through that, others around us have the opportunity to see the life that you are pouring out in us. And Lord, I pray that we would, as a church, be able to have that amazing blessing of others being able to point to heaven and say, you wore his coat well. And because of that, they receive life. Lord, we ask this in your name. Amen. Let's rise together. Yes, um, I didn't say this while we were um, on, and then just raise your hand so I remember what you were asking. Uh, if, um, while we were kind of cut out there for a little bit online, um, if you are able to hit the red bell, I believe it is, to subscribe to the YouTube channel, doesn't mean that you give information uh, that you're signing up for a lifelong membership to something that you'll get uh, stuff in the mail. It's simply saying that you're following the channel. If we get up to 100 uh, subscribers, we'll be able to have a dedicated link that will be the same, that will make it easier to send out that people ahead of time can know what that link is rather than um, an hour before worship sending out that link. So if you're able to do that, get other people to do it, um, that would be helpful. And um, combined service normally starts in July. So this typically would be our last uh, separate service. For the time being, we're going to continue to have the sep separate service, but our hope is that we will move into a combine, which will probably be in here, that we'll be able to separate. We've been having about 
um, 45, 40 in this service and about 40 in the second. So it's just making sure that we can continue to uh, do our best to stay, keep family units within six feet of each other. You guys have been doing great with that. And I know it's, um, you wanna get close to each other, but um, that's our hope. I mean, I, I'd love to have one service and, um, but at least for next week, we're still gonna have two. This song here we're going to do, we've done before, but we expanded our horizons a little bit and went into another verse that, that was there that we were just too chicken to do it um, because of the structure of the song. But it goes, the disease of self runs through my blood. It's a cancer fatal to my soul. Every attempt on my behalf has failed to bring this sickness under control. It's not going to be in the PowerPoint, and I don't expect you to remember what I just told you, but you can hum along, but come back in even stronger on the course and help us on that. go in peace and walk in the light of Christ as you find his life living in you. Amen.
Okay, we didn't practice it. That was the problem.